Hello, and welcome back to Stats Class. So, last time we looked at hypothesis testing um, for various proportions, and then today we're going to look at hypothesis testing around population means. So, kind of the same as the confidence interval unit, we started with proportions, then we moved on to means, we're doing the same thing here. We started with proportions, we're going to move on to means, and we're going to follow that same pattern in the next unit too, all right? We generally start with the proportions, we move on to the means, because um, the mean tends to be a little more involved. All right, so let's take a look at what we have here. So most people believe that if you roll a die over and over again, the average value will work out to be 3.5. However, during Statistics Club, it seemed we could control the value of the dice with a well-timed catchphrase. Let's conduct an experiment where we roll a die using catchphrases to see if it increases the average value of our rolls. So at this point in class, I would make everyone come up with a catchphrase, you know, something that they thought was lucky. We would then roll the dice a whole bunch of time with our catchphrases, um, and then we would calculate the average result to check to see if having a good catchphrase um, increases the values of your role. And you're probably saying to yourself, that's ridiculous, of course it doesn't, but it's the activity we would have gone through if um, we'd actually been in class right now. So we'll just kind of pretend that we're going through it today. All right, so one says, give the null and the alternative hypothesis for the die experiment. All right, so it's going to be pretty similar to what we did last time. We're going to start with a null hypothesis that the mean, and we use the population symbol for the mean, is equal to 3.5. That's our statement of no difference. And then our alternative is we're suggesting that having a strong catchphrase can help you roll higher. So since we're concerned with rolling higher, we would be saying the mean is greater than 3.5. And again, you should always pick your alternative. You should always pick your alpha before the experiment starts. So we'll start with an alpha of 0.05. So, if you think about this as the curve associated with a mean of 3.5, we're going to conduct an experiment, and we're going to see, do our results end up on the right side of the curve here, because we're testing greater than 3.5, and this is 5% of the curve, and this represents our reject zone. All right, this is where we're going to reject our null hypothesis and accept our alternative hypothesis. All right, so again, we would be rolling yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm just going to pick a number from last year and say that we averaged out to a value of 3.72. All right, so higher than 3.5. The question is, is 3.72 a significant difference? All right, is it a difference that is more than would be expected from random variation? Or is it just within the realm of random variation and not really a big deal? All right, so this says, well, our number probably isn't exactly 3.5. That is no surprise because of sampling variability. But how likely is it to get a mean this extreme simply due to sampling variability if the true mean um, is if the true mean is 3.5. Right. So we're going to check our conditions, same as we did with proportions, only the conditions are going to be a little bit different. All right? We've got our randomization. All right? And when you're rolling dice, that pretty much takes care of itself. All right? We have the 10% condition. All right, which is where your sample can not be more than 10% of the population. And that's if you're sampling without replacement. Um, if you have true independence, like we do 
with rolling dice, then we don't really need to worry about that. It's not like there's a population of die rolls. Um, each die roll is totally independent of the other, so we're fine there. The 10% condition is more when you're sampling without replacement, because technically each person is not totally independent of the other. All right, and then we have our normal condition, which states that the population should be normal, but if it's not, which is often the case, you just want n to be greater than 30 and no outliers. All right, we're going to do an example today where we can, we'll can we see the problem um, with outliers in this sort of analysis. Okay. So similar conditions to last time. Um, the only one that's really very different is the, is the normal condition there. All right, so let's take a look at how this is all going to play out. All right, so it says compute the sample statistic and standard deviation of the statistic. Okay. So first thing we need to do is figure out our sample statistic. Now that's just x bar, all right? That's just our mean right there, all right? So the mean I already told you Again, we're just going to use the number from last year, which was 3.72. Now, we're also going to need the sample standard deviation, because to find the standard deviation of the statistic, we're going to need the sample standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation of all of our dice rolls, and again, I'm just going to be using the numbers from a previous year, but the sample standard deviation, we're going to say, is 1.68. Now, sample standard deviation is different than the standard deviation of the statistic. All right, So sample standard deviation is just, we're using our calculator, we're calculating the standard deviation. Great. Standard deviation of the statistic... is where we're using our formula, because that's not the standard deviation of the individual die rolls. It's the standard deviation of the means we could calculate. All right, and that's where we're going to be using s of x over the square root of n. So again, I just told you our s of x is 1.68. And then again, just because I'm using the numbers from last year, the n is going to be 100, which is going to make the math a little easier because the square root of 100 is 10 and then if you divide something by 10 you're just sliding the decimal place one over so that's going to give us this 0.168 right. four says compute how many standard deviations away your observed score is from the sample proportion of the null hypotheses and this time we're calling it a t-score um, with the proportions, we use z-score, and the reason we're using the t-score is it goes back to what we did with the confidence intervals, where because we have to use a sample standard deviation, and we don't know the true standard deviation, um, that increases kind of our uncertainty. So we're going to be using the t-distribution instead of the normal distribution. And if you remember, the difference between a normal distribution and a T distribution, with those horrible pictures right there, is the T distribution has more area in the tails of the distribution. So that makes more extreme results more likely. Um, and that's just a representation of sort of the increased uncertainty. All right. So going back to our formula here, x bar is, again, our sample result. So that was our 3.72. All right. This is coming from our null hypothesis, so our population mean from our null, which is the 3.5. That's what we would expect when rolling dice. 
And then we already kind of did this bottom part here, but I'll just put the numbers back in. So it's the 1.68, which was our sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of n, which again, we've been using this formula for a little while now, gives us this right here. All right. So if we calculated that all out, it would work out to be about 1.31. All right. So this right here is our test statistic. All right. Next it says find your p-value, the proportion shaded in on the t-model using t-cdf, lower bound, upper bound, and degrees of freedom. All right, so just a quick reminder that degrees of freedom is always n minus 1. All right, and then there's this little bubble over here that says if for some reason you know the population standard deviation, you can calculate a z-score and use normal CDF. It's that's never really going to happen, all right? I'm never going to give you a problem where that happens. It's, it's hard to imagine a real-world scenario where that is, is true. We're mostly just going to be using um, TCDF for these types of problems. But I just put it there as sort of a disclaimer. So if we go to our calculator here, all right, and we go to the distribution menu, all right, there is a choice for TCDF, all right? Our lower bound would be 1.31. Our upper bound would be 9999. And the reason I know that it's positive is we're testing greater than, all right? Our alternative hypothesis was that it was greater than. So we're going from our test statistic up. And then our degrees of freedom, since our sample size was 100, is 99. We can paste that in there. Whoops, I'm in the wrong menu, so that's not actually going to work. Distribution, TCDF, all right, there it is. We can paste that in there, and we get a result of 0.0966. All right, so again, if we're showing work for this, TCDF from 1.31 to 9999 with 99 degrees of freedom, because again, our sample size was 100, so 100 minus 1, equals 0 0.0966, or we could also write that as 9.66%. Right. So then, if we're going to interpret our p-value in context, what this is saying is there's a 9.66% chance of getting a sample mean of 3.72 with n equal 100 if the true population mean is 3.5, all right? Again, the p-value is the odds of getting the sample result that you observed given kind of the assumptions that we have in place. So when we make our conclusion, all right, we would say we fail to reject the null because again, we never accept the null. We only fail to reject the null because our p-value is over 5%. All right, so in the context of the problem we were doing, that says we were unable to find sufficient evidence that having a awesome catchphrase um, actually increases the, the numbers that you get on your die when you roll it, which you're all saying to yourself, of course it doesn't, but it's just kind of the point of the activity, all right? So um, it matches what our intuition would have been that a catchphrase isn't actually going to change the result on the die. Either that or when I did it this year for this class, the, uh, the catchphrases just weren't good enough. Um, 
that's probably actually the more likely explanation. All right, so let's take a look at some other problems here so we can get um, a feel for how these are going to look when we're not doing like an actual an experiment. All right, so coffee machines. A coffee machine dispenses coffee into paper cups. You're supposed to get 10 ounces of coffee, but the amount varies slightly from cup to cup. Here are the amounts measured in a random sample of 20 cups. Is there evidence that the machine is shortchanging customers? All right, so this is the sort of thing where we can do a hypothesis test. Um, now, one thing we have to be careful of, in this problem, um, it tells us our sample size is only 20 cups. All right, so that is not above 30. And the problem um, doesn't really tell us that anything is sort of normally distributed. So it is a good idea to just kind of see what our sample data looks like um, to make sure we're not doing anything too crazy here since the problem doesn't tell us and our sample size is, is kind of on the small side. So I already have the data in stat edit. All right, and once it's there, there's a few different things that we could do. All right, so we could go to our stat plots. We could turn it on, and we could look at a histogram. All right. Oops. Hold on. And now it's freezing up. All right, so why that's unfreezing. Um, so we could look at the histogram. All right, that would be one option that we have. We could look at sort of our normal probability plots and see what those look like. Um, we could do a box and whisker plot to make sure that there are no outliers. Because remember, the calculator does have a feature where you can see whether or not there are any outliers um, when you're doing sort of a box and whisker there. So you've got a few options that, that we can look at um, to make sure that the data that we're dealing with is okay and not going to cause problems with what we're trying to do. All right, and it's still freezing up, so we're just going to go ahead for right now um, and do some of the rest of this problem, and then when it unfreezes, we'll go back to that. So I'm going to leave some space here at the top. Um, and instead, I'm just going to start with the null hypothesis. All right. So, again, the null hypothesis is always the statement of no difference. So, in this case, it's supposed to be 10 ounces. So, that would be our statement of no difference. We would expect the mean to be 10. All right. The problem says that it's worried about customers being shortchanged. So that means we're specifically testing is the mean less than 10. All right. So our alternative is going to be that the mean is less than 10. And then our alpha, because there's no compelling reason to use something else, we're going to use 0.05. All right, so that's kind of the first step, just as it always was. Now, the next thing we're going to need is a test statistic. All right, so to get our test statistic, we need our sample mean. So to get your sample mean, you could put all of this data into L1. You could run one variable stats. And you would end up with a sample mean of 9.845. All right, you're also going to need the sample standard deviation, which would be 0 0.1986. And then from those, you're also going to need the standard deviation of the statistic. All right, so that's where we're using our formula s of x over the square root of n. 
right? And that's going to be 0.1986 over the square root of n, which in our case is 20. All right. So those are kind of the three things that we're going to need. And then we can use those three things to calculate our test statistic. So again, our test statistic is going to be our X bar. So 9.845 minus the mean from our null hypothesis. So that would be 10 divided by the standard deviation of our statistic, which again is the one we get from our formula there. So 0.1986 divided by the square root of 20. All right, so that'll give us our test statistic, which if we work that all out, that's just some calculator work, and since my calculator is being annoying right now, I'm just going to write down that we get a negative 3.49. All right, so that's what we're going to be using inside of our TCDF. All right, so if we do a TCDF, again, we're using the T distribution, not the normal distribution here. So this time it's going to be from negative 999. All right? And the reason it's negative instead of positive is this time our null is less than, not greater than. So we're going from negative 9999 all the way up to the negative 3.49. And then with the TCDF, you also have to provide the degrees of freedom, which is always one less than your sample size, which in this case is 19. So this we would put into our calculator. This is going to spit back a number, and that number is your p-value. All right, so for this one, it works out to be 0 0.001, all right, which is saying there's one-tenth of a percent chance of getting that sample result if this was the true mean. All right, and that's a pretty small chance. So our conclusion is we reject the null and accept the alternative because our p-value is under 5%. All right. So again, my calculator is still being weird. So what I'm just going to say here is if we had um, put it in, you get a histogram that kind of looks something like this. All right, which is relatively normal looking. If you do a box and whisker plot, you're going to see that there are no outliers. So we're good there. I remember outliers are designated with the asterisk. And then if we did the normal probability plot, you would see that the points are relatively linear. And that's what we're looking for in a normal probability plot. So this has a somewhat normal shape. This is telling us that there's no outliers. Um, and this one, so this one is saying that it has a normal shape. And then again, with the normal probability plot, if it's linear, linear equals normal when you're dealing with a normal probability plot. So again, we could have just used our calculator to do some of those different things. Oh, I might actually be working now. All right. Stat edit. 
All right, so I've got my data in here. All right, so that's all the data that's that's supposed to be in there for this one. And then what we can see here is if we go to zoom nine, there's our histogram. All right, if we go to stat plot and change it over to a normal problem. Well, let's do the box and whisker first. All right. We'll zoom nine out again. You're going to see there's no asterisks, so that's what we're looking for there. That means there's no outliers. And then if we go to the normal probability plot, which is the last one there. All right, and then zoom nine that. You're going to see it's relatively linear, which is, again, what we're looking for on all of those. So we are okay here, even though our sample size is, is less than 30, because everything about our sample suggests that it's normal. All right, so let's answer these two more questions, and then we'll we'll stop this this part of the video. So, was your test one tailed upper, one tailed lower, or two tailed? Um, explain why you chose that choice. All right, so ours was one tail lower because we only cared if the machine. was shortchanging customers. And we got that from the problem. And then three, explain what your p-value means in this context. Again, I kind of already said that, but there is a 0.1% chance of getting a sample mean of 9.845 when n equals 20 if the true mean true population mean is 10. Alright, so that's pretty much always sort of what our p-value is representing. It's the odds of getting our sample result given some claim about the, the true value of the population. All right. And again, very similar to what we've done before. The main difference is that we're using like TCDF and we're using a different formula for the standard deviation of our statistic, but otherwise very, very similar. So let's take a look at another one of these, and this is going to specifically look at kind of the role that outliers can play in this. So it says, here are estimates of the daily intakes of calcium in milligrams for 38 women between the ages of 18 and 24 who participated in a study on women's bone health. Test the doctor's claim at 0.05 alpha. Now, the doctor's claim isn't actually in here, but what we're going to be testing on this one is that we're going to test against a null of 800. The mean is 800. And the alternative that we're going to be testing against here is actually that mu is greater than 800. All right, so again, it's not on this sheet here, but that's that's what we're actually going to be testing for this one. Um, and then our alpha is going to be 0.05. All right, so first thing to do, you've got a table of data like that. You're just going to want to put it into your calculator. Um, I've already got it in there. So if I go to stat, edit, there's all the data. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to need the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm going to run one variable stats. I'm going to say that my data is in L1. And that's going to give me all of the different things that I need. Um, so there's my X bar up the top. It's about 926. Um, there's my standard deviation for my sample, which is about 427. All right, so those are going to be the two numbers that we need right away from that. So our X bar is 926. Our sample standard deviation is 427. And then the standard deviation of the statistic, all right, remember that's the one where we're using this formula, is going to be the 427 
over the square root of n. And the problem told us there were 38 people, so we don't have to count them out. We can just use the 38 there. All right, so that's the standard deviation of our statistic. All right, so again, if we're getting our test statistic, all right, our test statistic, again, it's x bar minus the population mean that we get from our null hypothesis over the standard deviation of the statistic, which is where we're using our formula. All right, so then you just kind of have to plug everything into that. So in our case, it would be 926 minus the 800 divided by 427 over the square root of 38. All right, and that's all going to work out to be 1.82. So once you have your test statistic, you can bring that over to TCDF, again, not NCDF, but TCDF, because we have a sample standard deviation. So we go to TCDF, all right, this time we're going greater than 800, so we're going to start at the 1.82, we're going to go up to a positive 9999. The degrees of freedom is one less than our sample size, so that's 37. Put that in there, and we get a p-value of 0.0384. All right, so when we do our t... All right, sorry about that. I just had a little problem with my filming setup, so I had to cut that one short. But picking up where we left off, there's our t-cdf of 0.0384. So when your p-value is under 5%, we can write, we reject the null and accept the alternative. Again, because our p-value is under 5% there. Now, number two says, remove any outliers from the data and run the test again explain any differences in your result. So just a reminder, there's two different ways we can test for outliers. All right, we can either do the IQR test, and remember IQR is Q3 minus Q1, and then once you have that IQR, you can do Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, and you can do Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. All right, and if you go through that, it'll give you sort of the benchmarks on what's considered an outlier. All right, the other way you can do it is if you go to your stat plot and you go to the box and whisker that has the little asterisks or the little dots next to it, all right, when you bring up the graph, it's doing that test for you. So we can see that there are two outliers here. And if I click the trace button, I can see what those outliers are. So 1933 and 2433. So that's this one right here and this one right here. All right. So let's see what happens if we redo this with those outliers removed. All right, so I'm also going to take the chance to show you how this works on the calculator. So I'm going to go to stat edit, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete out those two numbers. All right, and I put them both at the bottom because I already knew what we were going to be doing here. All right, so I'm deleting out those two numbers. Now, if I want to do the test on the calculator, I can go to stat, tests, all right? We are never using z-test, all right? Just like we never use z-interval, we only use t-interval. Same thing with the tests here, all right? You should never be picking z-test. We're picking t-test, all right? Much like the confidence intervals, you can either pick whether you want to put in the statistics, and then it's going to ask you for the null hypothesis, your X bar, your S of X, your sample size, or you can tell it just to use the data in your calculator. All right, so we have our data in the calculator, so there's no reason not to just use that. Our null hypothesis was that it was 800. 
and we were testing to see whether it was greater than 800. All right, so we would choose this one right here. All right. And when we do that, it'll give you a test statistic. So it gives us this test statistic of 1.099. So our test statistic was 1.099. All right, it gives us a p-value right here of 0.1396. So p-value of 0.1396. Um, and then it tells you the sample mean. It tells you the sample standard deviation. Um, it tells you the sample size, which is 36, because I did remove those two outliers. Um, but you're seeing that removing those two data points swung the p-value quite a bit. We went from 0 0.0384, which was a reject the null, to a 0 0.1396, which is a we fail to reject the null. All right, um, because the p-value is now over 5%. So you do have to be careful. It is important that you test for outliers um, because one or two outliers can totally swing your conclusion one way or another. So in the very beginning when we were talking about testing the conditions, all right, we did say that you, know, you want n to be greater than 30, which it was for this one, but you also want to make sure you don't have any outliers because the outliers can really swing your results, and, and you saw that here, all right? Removing the outliers switched us from a reject to a fail to reject type situation. So that is something that you have to look out for with these types of problems, just to make sure that you don't have um, any outliers. So keep that in mind. And then again, just always use T interval, not T interval, sorry, T test. All right. All right, always use the t-test. All right, z-test is a big no. All right, we're not going to be using that. Because, again, you'd have to know the population standard deviation, and that's just not realistic that you would generally know that information. Right. So let's move on. All right, at the Hawaii Pineapple Company, managers are interested in the sizes of pineapples grown in the company's field. Last year, the mean weight of pineapples harvested from one large field was 31 ounces. A new irrigation system was installed um, in this field after the growing seasons. Managers wondered whether this change will affect the mean weight of future pineapples grown in the field. To find this out, they select and weigh a random sample of 50 pineapples from this year's crop. Uh, the mini tab, which is just a statistical software, output below summarizes the data. Conduct a hypothesis test to see if there's a difference in the size of the pineapples. Also, generate a confidence interval and compare the results. Okay. So, let's start with the hypothesis test. All right. So, our null is that the mean has stayed the same. So, that would be that it is 31. And then, because the problem just says, is there a difference, it doesn't speculate whether the difference is an increase in size or a decrease in size, our alternative is just going to be that u does not equal 31. All right, we're going to keep our alpha at 05. Now, again, we're going to start doing these on the calculator instead of doing them all out by hand, but we do not pick z-test, we pick t-test. All right, this time we don't have data, we only have stats. So we start with our null hypothesis, which is that the value is 31. Then we put in our sample mean, which we get from this right here, and it's 31.935. Right. Then we put in our standard deviation, our sample standard deviation, which is right here, 2.394. 
we put in our sample size, which is here, and it was also told to us in the problem. And then we have to pick what our alternative is, and this time we're doing a not equal to. All right, so when we do calculate, all right, we get this output here. So for our t test, we got a test statistic, which is what we use in our TCDF when we're doing it by hand, of 2.76, and we got a p-value of 0 0.0081. And generally, when you're doing these on the calculator, I do want you to write out the test statistic. I do want you to write out the p-value, just so that I can see kind of um, what you came up with. Which, a p-value of 0 0.0081 is below our threshold of 5%, so this would be a reject the null type situation. Now, the problem also asks for a confidence interval. So we're going to again go to stat, we're going to go to tests, and we're going to go down to t interval. All right, again, we don't use the interval. All right, we're going to put in the stats. Now it actually uses the numbers that we just put in there. So there's our 3195, there's our 2394, there's our n is 50. We're going to do the confidence level at 95 because our significance level was 5%. So that's kind of equivalent, a 95% confidence level and a 5% um, threshold. So let's put this down here. We're doing a T interval. And when we do this and hit enter, we're going to get an interval from 31.255 all the way up to 32.615. So again, that's our estimate for where the true value lies. Now, what you'll notice is, and this is kind of the point of this problem, is that with our hypothesis test, we rejected the null. We rejected the claim that 31 was the true mean of our pineapples. Now, what you'll notice is our interval does not contain the value 31. So these two things are in agreement. All right, this is saying that 31 is not the true mean of our population. And this, in giving us a range of possible values, does not include 31. All right, if we had had a higher p-value and had failed to reject the null, then we would have expected 31 to be inside of this interval. And that's kind of what these notes down here say at the bottom. As with proportions, there's a link between a two-sided test. Again, this only applies to the two-sided tests, not a one-tailed test, at a significance level and a confidence interval for the population mean. All right, so 95 and 5%, 99 and 1%, 90 and 10%, there's this, this connection. Um, when the two-sided significance test basically rejects the null, your interval will not contain the value. When the two-sided test fails to reject the null, your interval will contain the value. And we talked about this with proportions. The only difference is that for means, the link is going to be exact. With proportions, we said there could be a slight gap at the edges because one uses sample values and one uses population values. But for means, we're always using the sample standard deviation. We don't have any population values, so the link is exact. All right. If you're rejecting the null, it won't be inside the interval. If you're failing to reject the null, it will be inside the interval. And that's that link is going to hold true every single time. All right. So moving on. Compare data. Sometimes we compare samples that are not independent of one another. All right. Matched pairs is a type of sampling design that yields data that may be interesting, but the samples are not independent from each other, so we can't proceed with our standard difference in two means procedure. 
right? So what it means is we can't use exactly what we've been doing if we're comparing kind of two samples that are that are not independent from one another. So let's see how we do this instead. All right, so when obs let's talk about fair data first. When observations are collected in pairs or the observations in one group are naturally related to observations in the other group. All right, and the two ways that we usually see this is a before and after treatment. So somebody gets a treatment before, somebody gets a treatment after, so it's literally the same person, so obviously they're not independent of one another. And then the other way is when subjects are paired via natural similarity. So maybe same age, same height, same exercise habits, same weight, you know, whatever, but they're paired via some natural similarity. All right, so let's take a look at kind of how this works when you have paired data. So having done poorly on their math final exams in June, six students repeat the course in summer school and take another exam in August. So if we consider these students representative of all students who might attend the summer school in other years, do these results provide evidence that the program is worthwhile? All right, so the way that we generally have to do this is when we have this paired data, instead of looking at the individual results, we only look at the difference between the results. So what I'm going to do for each of these scores is I'm going to do June minus August. And I'm going to say, all right, here the difference is 4. Here the difference is negative 16. Here the difference is negative 6. Here the difference is positive 2. Here the difference is negative 6. Here the difference is negative 10. All right. Now, when I'm testing to see whether I can do my analysis, I don't care whether the individual data is normal. I care whether these differences are normal. So when I'm talking about my conditions, I don't evaluate my conditions based off the original data. I evaluate my conditions off the differences that I calculated. All right, this is what I actually care about when I'm seeing, can I conduct this procedure? All right, so other than that, it pretty much follows sort of the same procedure. All right, so I would say my null is that there's no difference between these two. Now, what that's going to be represented is, is by saying mu equals zero. All right, this would represent no difference because when I subtract June and August, if I get, if there's no difference between the two, that should average out to be zero. And then for me, the alternative is, we're trying to see whether summer school helped. Now, based on the way I did the subtraction, we can see that higher scores actually are a negative difference. So for me, I would say mu is less than zero because I'm seeing, did it improve people's score? And again, the way I did this out, um, negatives actually mean that your score improved. If I had done August minus June, then these would have been positive and I could have done greater than zero. But again, it's just the order in which I subtracted it. All right. So once you've done that, you know, it's really exactly the same as all the other problems that we just did. So you'd put your data into the calculator. 
All right, so there's my data inside of the calculator. I've got 4, negative 16, negative 6, 2, negative 6, negative 10. All right, there's all my data in the calculator. I would go to stat tests. I'm doing a T test. This time I have my data in the calculator, so I can go there. All right, my mean is 0. List is L1, and then I'm checking to see are we less than zero again because of the way that I subtracted it. I can hit calculate. All right, it'll give me a t statistic of negative 1.75. So I did a t test. I got a test statistic of negative 1.75. And I got a p-value, again, that's the second one down there, of 0 0.0699. All right, which would be a, oh, the only thing I didn't write here is my alpha of 0 0.05 at the start. All right, but based on comparing these two, my p-value is above my alpha. So this is a... We fail to reject the null. All right, we don't have enough evidence to show that summer school is actually helping. Now, part of that is probably because we just only had six data points. All right, if you only have six data points, you need to see a lot of evidence that it's helping because you have so few observations. If there had been a much larger sample size, um, we might not have run into the same situation. Um, but because our sample size was so small, you need to have really compelling evidence, and our evidence wasn't compelling enough, so we failed to reject the null in this situation. All right, so paired data, pretty similar to what we've been doing. It's just you start off by subtracting them. All right, so here's another example of paired data. It says, most people believe that country air is better to breathe than city air, but how would you prove it? Um, you might start by choosing a response that narrows down what you mean by better. One feature of healthy lungs is that they are quick to get rid of nasty stuff they breathe in. And then it goes on and kind of explains that. So investigators managed to find seven pairs of identical twins that satisfied two requirements. One twin from each pair lived in the country. The other lived in a city. All right, both twins were willing to inhale an aerosol of radioactive Teflon particles. Why they were, I have no idea. Um, the level of radioactivity was measured twice for each person right after inhaling and then again an hour later. The response was the percent of original radioactivity still remaining one hour after inhaling. All right, so again, because these people are related, all right, we can't use the individual data. We're going to have to use the differences. Now, I could go and subtract those all by hand, but the other thing you could do is you go to 10 point. I could just put in each set of data. So let me do that really quick. Uh, all right, and then let me put in the L2 data, 36.2, 40.7, 38.8. Seventy-one, forty-seven, fifty-seven. All right, and then I can just let the calculator do it for me. If I go up top here to L3, so the cursor is actually on the L3, and then I type in L1 minus L2, it'll do all of those subtractions for me, and then I can just put that right into the calculator. So, test an appropriate hypothesis. So again, when you're doing these paired data, the null is always going to be the same, that mu is zero, that there's no difference between the two of those. Now, for alternative, you have to be careful here because you have to pay attention to which way you subtracted. So I did rural minus urban. And again, this number represents the percent left over which means low is good. So generally, if the hypothesis is that rural is going to be better than urban, generally what we're expecting is to be doing a small 
minus a large. That's sort of our starting hypothesis, which means we're expecting to get negative numbers. So our mu is going to be that it's less than zero. Our alpha is going to be 0 0.05. We're going to be doing a t test. And then again, the only thing you have to be careful of is I put my data into L3. So you just have to make sure that you update that if you did put it in something different. Otherwise, everything else is pretty much good to go. It gives me a p-value of 0.167. So it gives me a test statistic of negative 1.04. And it gives me a p-value of 0 0.1671. All right, which is above our alpha, so this is a fail to reject the null. All right, and then what would it say? What would a type one and type two error be in this context? All right, remember type one is when we fail to reject the null and we're wrong, so that would be we say, I mean, sorry, we reject the null and we're wrong. We we say country air is better, and we're wrong. So a type 1 is when you reject the null and you're wrong. A type 2 is when you fail to reject the null and you're wrong. So in this context, it would be we say the air is the same, But country air is better, or rural air is better. Yeah, up here I probably should say rural. That's what the, the, the question used. All right. So again, just kind of remembering type 1 is when you reject the null and you're wrong. Type 2 is when you fail to reject the null and you're wrong. All right. So last but not least, just some final thoughts on significance testing. Um, statistical significance and practical importance. When a null hypothesis can be rejected at the usual levels, there's good evidence of a difference, but that difference may be very small. When large samples are available, even tiny deviations from the null hypothesis will be significant. So just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's actually like important. So for example, if you have an N that's really, really large, all right, and your null hypothesis is that u equals 10, and your alternative is that u is not equal to 10, and you get a sample result of 9.99, all right, that might show up as statistically significant because your sample was so large, but you might not actually care about this difference. It might not mean anything in the, in the real world. And on the same token, um, the flip side is also true. Sometimes things won't show up as statistically significant, but there might be real-world value to it. It might just be that you weren't able to get a large enough sample, but that doesn't mean there's not some real importance between the difference there. So these are kind of just saying opposite sides of the same thing. Um, statistical inference is not valid for all sets of data. Basically, if you've got bad data, this isn't going to work. You know, you can't like massage the data to, to fix it. If you have like a biased sample, you've pretty much got to throw it out and start over. It's not going to work. And then beware of multiple analyses. Um, when you use this, it should be that you have a hypothesis and you're testing it. You shouldn't just gather a whole bunch of data and run tests on everything. Because remember, you are going to make a mistake 5% of the time if you're using an alpha of 5%. So if you test thousands of thousands of things just to see what is significant, you're going to get some type 1 errors that don't mean anything.